Howdy, friends. Welcome to 50's Cheese. My name is Clem, and the boss sent me out here to the garage to show you these movies, since he's embarrassed to be seen with them. What we have here are highlights of cheap old movies that don't really have highlights. And just some scenes that aren't quite as bad as others. And from the golden age of B-movies. And since Misery Loves Company, I'll be joining you in watching them. Only I'll be commenting on them as well. You can too, only nobody will hear you. These are the kind of movies you would have seen on Mystery Science Theater 3000. In fact, a few of them were. The rest probably weren't good enough. I don't want to mislead you more than I have to. These are not, strictly speaking, first-time viewing reactions. The ones from MST3K I've seen before, of course. But what you will be seeing are mashups of two viewings. One to get my bearings, and one to catch whatever I missed the first time. And they won't be the full movie, just highlights, or lowlights to be more accurate. And the more memorable scenes. So, with all that in mind, let's watch the movie. Hello, friends. Now, before anything else, let me explain. First of all, this is a more complex production than we've tried up till now. Clem didn't really feel like uh, he was up to it, so he asked me to take his place. Now, I'm his older brother, Clayton. Now, a while back, we did a two-part special of two different movies, which were both edited and dubbed from the same original Russian film. These were Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet and Voyage to the Planet of Prehistoric Women, which you should watch if you get a minute. Both cut out of Planet of Storms, originally a Planeta Burr in Russian. Now this is another multi-part episode, but uh, approached differently. First, we have the original German movie, oh boy, Der Schweigender Stern, or The Silent Star. Now, that's East German, so be prepared for a bit of propaganda. And then, on the American side, there's the first spaceship on Venus. And there's a bit of propaganda on this side as well. But they pretty much balance out. You know, coincidentally, those other two films were also about trips to Venus. Now, the tricky part of all this is that we'll be presenting both films together using a split screen. This will be fun. I'll warn you up front, there will be numerous starts and stops to keep the two streams relatively close or to explain things that need explaining. There are a few scenes removed from the German version and a few small trims here and there. The biggest problem is that the two films seem to run at slightly different frame rates. And I don't know how they manage that. Now, the first thing you'll notice is the German version has complete opening credits. The American, just a few. Total Vision seems to be the uh, Soviet ripoff of CinemaScope. And the really weird thing is the cast. The American edition only lists two actors. The German, all of them. But wait, it gets weirder. It lists the actors' uh, names all right, but it doesn't list the characters' names. 
It lists their job descriptions. Well, please excuse my feeble attempts at pronunciation. Yoko Tani, the Japanese doctor. Aldrich Lucas, the American nuclear physicist. Ignacy Mikowski, the Polish chief engineer. Julius Angewe, the African television technician, although they only have a radio. Mikhail N. Posnikov, the Soviet astronaut. Kurt Rackelman, the Indian mathematician. Gunther Simon, the German pilot. Hua Ta Tang, the Chinese linguist. And Lucina Winika, the television reporter. And many actors from different countries and Omega the Robot. Well, that's just how the credits list them. But we're not done. The characters also have names. Now, you might be able to pick them up by very carefully listening. Uh, but I prefer Internet Movie Database and Wikipedia. Yoko Tani, the Japanese doctor, is Sumiko Ogamura. Aldrich Lucas, the American nuclear physicist, Professor Halling. Ignacy Mikowski, the Polish chief engineer, Professor Saltik. Julius Ngawe, the African <coughs> television technician, Talua. Mikhail N. Posnikov, the Soviet astronaut, Professor Arseniev. Kurt Rackelman, the Indian mathematician, Professor Sikarna. Gunther Simon, the German pilot, Raymond Brickman. Hua Ta Tang, Chinese linguist, Dr. Chen Yu. Lucina Winika, television reporter, Joan Moran, although I don't think she's ever actually addressed by name. Many actors from different countries in Omega the Robot. And we're still not done. Some of the characters had their names, job titles, and or nationalities changed for the American release. Aldrich Lucas changed from Halling to Orloff. Ignacy Mikowski from Polish to French and Saltic to Durand. Mikhail N. Posnikov is a biggie. From Arsenev to Herringway. Soviet to American. Astronaut to astrophysicist. And added mission commander. Gunther Simon from German pilot to American pilot, astronaut, first man to walk on the moon, and from Raymond to Robert Brinkman. Uh, Hua Ta Tang added biologist. Now, poor Omega the robot had his name mispronounced throughout the entire American version. The music track was totally replaced. And even the name of the rocket ship gets a tweak. Now, that should be enough of the behind-the-scenes stuff for now. In 1985, during the course of the work... Under the very first line spoken is a contradiction. A I guess the American producers decided 10 years in the future wasn't enough. 25 sounded more reasonable. Research revealed that it contained a spool. Further analysis showed the material to be extraterrestrial in origin and not of human manufacture. Where did it come from? Is it just me... Or does that thing look like a foil-wrapped pork loin? Then somebody remembered that in June 1908 in Siberia, an explosion had occurred equivalent in force to a hydrogen bomb, an explosion visible within a radius of 350 miles. Hmm. At the Misleading. Time, it was to have been by hydrogen bombs meteor. come in varying sizes. Years later, 
When most people say hydrogen bomb, they mean the one at Nagasaki, which had a yield of 21 kilotons. The blast at Tunguska, not Tangu, has been estimated at about 12 megatons, or about 572 Nagasaki bombs. There were numerous expeditions to the site from 1927 onward. And it was determined early on that the object, whatever it was, approached the area from the east-southeast, roughly today's Kazakhstan. A connection with the Gobi Desert is impossible. Shortly afterwards, under the auspices of the World Federation for Space Research, scientists meet to celebrate the anniversary of the establishment of the first space station on the moon. Professor Herringway from the United States makes a public statement about the famous meteor. Our calculations indicate, confirmed also by the results recently transmitted to us by our colleagues on Luna 3, that the mysterious Tunga meteor Tunguska. was really a spaceship from another planet which exploded in the air before landing. This hypothesis stimulated scientific thought throughout the world. Reporters of every nation are waiting to hear what the nuclear physicist Professor Orloff has to say. The 350 miles, the Gobi is over a thousand miles from Tunguska, and in the wrong direction. I believe there was a grave emergency when the rockets normally used for deceleration refused to function. The captain of the spaceship decided to save what he considered was most valuable. I'm referring naturally to the spool, which may contain a document of prime importance in an unknown language, recorded apparently by magnetic process. An international committee of expert linguists was offered access to the world's largest computer. Well, I don't know about the world's largest computer, whatever that means, but you can check out the world's fastest at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'll leave a link in the description if, you, if you're interested. To try to decipher this strange language. This is Dr. Chen Lu. Not only is he one of the world's leading authorities on languages, but also his biological work is of immense importance. Humanity is in debt to him for the technique of transforming inorganic substances into foodstuffs. He directs the committee with world-famous mathematician Professor Sikarna, whose work rivals even that of Einstein. In the astrophysical domain, we've made rapid progress. And although we haven't deciphered the mysterious message, we have determined the ship's launching base. At the moment, there can be no doubt. This spaceship was launched within our solar system. I can even say that it was definitely launched from within the path of our planet. Now, since there can be no life on Mercury, there is only one other planet that it could have come from. I am referring to the Earth's sister planet, Venus the morning star. on Earth. That's right. It certainly is a chemico-physical analysis of the atmosphere oh, and the crust of the Earth. Earth. What we have just heard are the first words of the inhabitants of another planet, a cosmic document. Yes. Yes, but 
It's unfortunate that the magnetic spool was damaged through the effect of the high temperature which prevailed aboard the cosmic vessel at the time of the crash. And that's the reason we've only heard a part of the text. We must try to find a method to renovate the rest. First, we'll immerse the spool in a chemical catalytical medium, and after that, subject it to radiation. Chen Yu? Yes, that's a very good idea. All that we have learned indicates that on Venus, there is a highly developed life form. Yet I'm wondering why Venus stays silent. It's very surprising. Now we know a little of this language. We must, at every cost, communicate with her. I agree with you. It's high time we made this end. Well, then, I'd like to propose a course of action. I think the most logical thing to do would be to request that our governments consent to train all the radio and radar stations of the world and Venus. Polar station calling Moon Space Station. Attention, please. Luna 3. Attention, please. Luna 3. Thank you. This is Station Luna 3. I'll keep it in mind. Station Luna 3 calling Earth. No replies yet from Venus. Our signals are reaching the planet, but so far there's no reply. We'll keep you informed. Good morning, my friends. May I please have an interview? This afternoon, I have news of the utmost importance to announce. As you probably know already, our most modern spaceship, the Cosmostrator, is now completed and ready to set forth on our exploration of space. The World Federation for Space Research has decided to change the destination of the Cosmostrator. Instead of sending her to Mars, she will be directed toward the planet Venus. Oh, that's great news, isn't it? Have you any idea as to the date of the takeoff? One more question, if you don't mind, Professor. Do you think there's anybody living on Venus? Did you manage to make contact with Venus? No, my friends, Venus is silent, but we'll soon discover why. And who's going with you? Well, let me present some of the other scientists who will take part in this expedition. They are all first-class specialists, chosen from among the most qualified in their particular... Remember this guy. They, with others who are coming, will form the crew of Cosmostrator 1. Why don't you not with a team that only from Soviet scientists? It's not your rocket. The first of the deleted German scenes. I can't figure out why this was cut. It explains much about the makeup of the expedition and presents a message of peaceful cooperation. The second cut scene, this one makes more sense to remove. It contributes little, if anything, to the story. It's confusing. Just who are these people? They're called the Consortium once, but of what? Is it government? Is it a scientific organization? It seems they have some sort of authority overhauling, but, but what? There's some mention of H-bomb testing, uh, using an inaccurate time frame which maybe the American crew didn't want. But they were right about a scientific organization being run by a bunch of grumpy old men. Units of propulsion are in perfect working order. That's fine. The crew can now attend to their personal affairs. We'll start late tomorrow night and fly following the hyperbolic trajectory. Good. I'll make a last check. See you later, Doran. Taloa, will you please make a thorough recheck of the radar? Right away. The third excised scene. No reason to include it. No reason to cut it. Too short and meaningless to make any difference either way. Der 
This is Intervision calling the world. We have just showed you the preliminary test of the Cosmos Trader's rocket. Arriving now is Brinkman, the first American spaceman to land on the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an important announcement to make. Intervision is going to present you minute by minute the historic launching of the Cosmos Trader. We know very well how much you'd like to be here with us. Unfortunately, that's impossible. The only ones admitted are those directly concerned with the countdown and final blast off of the rocket. So I will try to describe in detail everything that's taking place. Intervision will bring to you the wonderful story of this great event. Ah, but here come the first members of the crew. Among them is Professor Durand, the chief engineer. He's a French scientist well known for his work on robots. Thank you. Thank you. We'll load the chronicopter later on in the evening. That's, of course, designed for you. Yes, of course. I've checked out your electronic equipment. Good. Professor Durand, report from Station A. Your celestial charts are ready. Thank you. Hello, Durand. Oh, Durand. I'm glad to see you again. So am I. Still working as hard? How about showing me your latest creation in... Remember this guy that I told you to remember? The guy who has been here all along, but only just now arrived, bringing an American nuclear physicist in a MiG-15? Confused? Yeah, me too. I hear it's a masterpiece. Around here we have nothing but masterpieces. Omega. Omega. Come here, Omega. Omega's cartoon entrance music is only in the American version. Obviously an attempt at comic relief. But this is the only scene where that Omega, happens. What's the weather report for the next 10 hours? And why do robots always have to have rotating antennas? Wow, that's fantastic. Your latest invention? Oh, nothing special. Just a small gadget. You're a lot too modest, Zero. What else does it do? He reacts to stimuli in his environment, evaluates them with his electronic brain. I recently managed to give Omega an elementary memory. Wonderful. Perhaps he might consent to play chess with me. Why, of course. Oh, no, I shouldn't be. In the fourth deleted scene. An opportunity to get philosophical. And that's about it. I almost expect to see Julie Andrews in the background. Und diese seltsame Spule gibt nicht mehr her, als wir schon wissen. Worte. Worte ohne Sinn. Ja, glauben Sie wirklich, dass die Spule etwas enthält, was uns zwingen könnte, den festgelegten Start etwa hinauszuzögern? Ich bin kein Hellseher. And they're going to walk all the way back to the base? This specially picked crew of the Cosmos Trader have reached Urania. Eight of them, scientists, mathematicians, and astrophysicists. Seven men and, and a woman. She's the physician of the expedition and has already spent two years on Luna 3. Sumiko. Break. Have I changed that much? Well, I don't know. I've got it. Your hair used to hang down to your waist. Mr. Brinkman. Yes? I forgot this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Robert Brinkman, the man who's always forgetting something. I have a reputation for that. You're right. But there are things I'll never forget. No, Brinkman. On a voyage of this kind, 
There'll be no room for excess baggage. Dr. Sumiko Omigora. 30 hours left. 30 hours and the Cosmos Raider will blast off into the unknown. Now we will leave the air. In the next few hours, the crew of eight picked for the Cosmos Raider will be unable to communicate with the world. They are going into a state of artificially induced sleep till the time comes for them to take off. This is to make sure that they will be in good physical condition for the effort to come. This is Intervision. Good afternoon. Brinkman, in two minutes you'll be asleep, like all your colleagues, whether you want to or not. You'll be able to see and hear your heart. I'm very glad you're coming with us, Sumiko. That way I'll be near you. Your heartbeat is normal. Sumiko, my heart is... No, Brinkman, no. No, please, we mustn't speak of that, ever. Good night, Robert. It's time for you to sleep, too, Dr. Sumiko. Yes, you're right. is ready. After a good night's artificially induced sleep, our crew will be raring to go. Stop back in a week and a half or so and blast off for Venus. <laughs>